Hello everyone, um, my name is Sean. I will be the moderator for today. Uh, thank you all for coming to the third session today. I know it's late in the day and um, not exactly the best time and best time to be to be this thing. To questions for justice, liberalism, very heavy things. But um, this opportunity is a really special one because we have with us uh, Professor Chandra Kukatan. Uh Professor is a he is the chair at in political theory at the London School of Economics. Um, he did his BA in History and Political Science at the Australian National University. Went on to do a MA in Politics at the University of New South Wales. And before going on to do his DPhil in Politics at Oxford. Um, Professor Kukathas has taught at the Royal Military College in Canberra. taught at Oxford, he has taught at ANU and has taught at at the University of New South Wales as well as the University of Utah, where he held the new Maxwell Chair in Political Theory. Now, um, without further ado, I'm going to begin the session. In terms of the structure of this session, how it will work out is I will have a conversation with Profess, with Prof about Prof's theory for about half an hour to 45 minutes. After which, I will invite the speakers from this morning's sessions, uh, Hasman Imran and Dr. Masli, to join us on the panel, and I will have an open Q&A discussion. Um, open is a slight misnomer because I am of the firm personal view that I like to structure the Q&A slightly, just to give a bit more structure to the uh, discussion and to ensure a bit more uh, deep discussion. So um, I will explain a bit more about Q&A when we get to Q&A. Um, so, Prof, to start things off, I think everyone has spent hours in the morning and the afternoon talking about justice. I want to take, I want to take a step back and um, looking at things from a more meta perspective, do you think that talking about justice, talking about how or society distributes resources, um, what sort of value should the just society believe in? Is, are those the right questions to ask? I mean, they have been uh, talking about the answers, but perhaps you should step, step back and ask whether those are the right questions to ask in the first place. Um, I don't think it's never the right question to ask. It does depend very much on the circumstances or the context in which uh, discussion is taking place, whether you make the question one about justice. The problem with making justice the framework for the discussion, for the exploration of an issue or for a debate, is that if you are living uh, or operating in a context where uh, values are very diverse and understandings of bases for distribution, for example, are diverse if you're talking about distribution as the issue, then you're almost invariably going to get many different conceptions of justice, many theories of justice. Now, in those circumstances, it's difficult to say, well, what we'll do is we'll just figure out what is the right theory of justice, because by hypothesis, you know, um, there are many different theories of justice around there. Now, of course, what you could say is, well, what we'll do is we will uh, devote our time to arguing about this, and out of this debate and discussion, the right theory of justice will emerge. Now, there's no reason why this couldn't be in principle, but I think in practical terms, there are lots of reasons why uh, this is not going to happen. One reason is simply that in advancing their theories of justice, some people will be uh, averting to arguments that really suit their own particular interests. In some cases, it will be the fact that people actually have different ethical starting points for thinking about justice. They've got different views about how to think about, for example, the nature of the individual, the relationship between the individual and the community, uh, the nature of the uh, ultimate values that distribution should be um, pitched at. Now, if this is the case, the problem with focusing on justice as the center of your 
attention is that you either end up uh, talking past one another or you end up trying to um, secure one particular conception of justice uh, that some people might accept but that others simply will not, in which case justice becomes a means of enforcing a view which uh, most people don't accept. Now, one way to try to resolve this problem is the way that John Rawls uh, attempted. And this is what I think many of you have been looking at during the day today. And the crucial thing about Rawls is that he saw this problem. And he thought, well, maybe what we can do is we can think of justice as that moral understanding that comes out of people coming together and thinking about what kind of view of justice all of them would accept. Now, when he first conceived of this, he thought, maybe think about people as bargainers in the game. Okay. And the right theory of justice would be the one that they concluded the bargain uh, with. He eventually abandoned that because he thought that the bargaining metaphor was not the right one. But he tried to retain this um, insight. That is to say, the theory of justice that's the appropriate one is the theory which everybody could accept. And that's not a bad strategy, but to go back to my original point about the, the problem with the fact that there are different conceptions of justice or different understanding of justice or values, the problem with that is that if you're actually going to secure agreement on the conception of justice, there must be some basis for your reaching agreement. There has got to be some set of background values that's going to make this possible. Now here the problem is that the wider the range of values you try to incorporate, the harder it is to reach agreement. But if you narrow the range of values that you admit into the discussion, the easier it is to reach agreement, but the more difficult it is then to do so without excluding a whole range of things, a whole range of perspectives. So uh, this is why I think if you focus on the, the notion of justice, you will either end up, if you're adopting this particular strategy, having a a conception that is so narrow that too many people are excluded, or you will end up um, having something which um, really in the end does not qualify as a theory of justice because it will turn out to be, be something else. It will be some sort of set of norms which incorporates a whole range of particular values. Now, um, Bob, to focus a bit on Rawls' theory in particular. Now, Rawls was not unaware of this problem. Yes. And he tried very hard to avoid it. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and to the end, he maintained that his theory was free, of, free from this problem, that his uh, political conception of justice was not dependent on any sort of um, personal conception of justice which abound in our society, that it's some kind of neutral conception of justice that anyone in the original position behind the veil of ignorance would agree to, regardless of their own personal fundamental beliefs about morality, about justice. But why do you think then that in some way there is a hidden, and how well, do you think that firstly, do you think then that there is some hidden conception of justice embedded within Rawls' world? And how exactly is this hidden conception of justice embedded within um, Rawls' theory uh, about the bar about uh, parties uh, bargaining and agreeing to this supposedly political and neutral conception of justice? Okay. Well, it's it's not hidden, um, but it's. A solution that he comes up with that really does suffer from one of these two problems that I that I mentioned is either going to be so include so inclusive that it can only manage by um, 
extending the theory to a point that is very, very general, or it's going to be um, uh, very, very um, precise as a theory of justice, but at the cost of excluding any people. What Rawls really ended up doing is responding to this criticism by saying, you know, that's right. What I'm coming up with is not a universal theory. What it is really is a theory that speaks to a particular people in a particular historical period. The bargain that he imagines, or the agreement he imagines, is one that takes place uh, among people who share a certain number of background assumptions, background values, so they can actually reach agreement. So when he constructs the original position, what he's trying to do is to articulate this. Uh, now, what is the relevant society then? It's basically the United States mm -hmm. in the late 20th century. He says, by this stage, the United States has reached a point where it has, in fact, embodied in its practice a number of values um, central to this uh, is a certain understanding of freedom and a certain understanding of equality. It's a society which has you know, abandoned slavery. It is a society that's tried to promote civil rights. It's a society that's tried to ensure certain sorts of uh, economic inequalities. So this is the, the, the society that he's trying to articulate a political theory for in the form of a theory of justice. Now, of course, the problem is that the United States, despite this set of shared values, is also a society in which there are many other people with different values. There are many religious traditions, from the Jewish to the Muslim to the Hindus and Christians. There are many denominations of Christians. There are atheists. But also, ideologically, there are people who are socialists and communists, as well as people who are conservatives and libertarians people who are you know, uh, liberals and democrats. Now, all of these people don't necessarily buy into uh, Rawls' theory. But what Rawls has tried to do is to shape the theory in such a way that he thinks it's going to bring together a kind of consensus that can incorporate all these different perspectives. But what he also concedes is that some of these perspectives won't be included because some of them simply in the end won't uh, buy his theory. And what he says about some of them is that, well, you know, they don't get included in um, this, uh, this theory. They don't get included as people who will, in fact, endorse this theory. Now, the problem then is that if that's the case, how can you say that this is a theory of justice that can, in fact, appeal to the society as a whole? Because then it looks awfully like um, it's simply either a section of the community that's making the running and saying this is what justice is, or perhaps it's the majority that's making the running. In either case, you're excluding a certain number of people. Now, what Rawls wants to say is, though, this is actually as close as you're going to get, and it's pretty good, because there, there is a very broad consensus. But, so there are two problems, too. One is that some people are going to get excluded. Um, and um, uh, secondly, you've bought what inclusion you've got by really narrowing the focus of the theory. So it's no longer a theory of justice as such. It's really a theory of, that tries to justify the existing set of institutions, which are the ones that people all already accept. Mm -hmm. And maybe one thing one might worry about here is that such a theory, by essentially trying to articulate the values implicit in existing institutions, will turn out to be a very conservative theory, one which perhaps lacks a certain kind of critical edge. Not that it will have none, because it will still be the basis for criticizing some arrangements, but ultimately it's a view that seems to say, well, you know, we start with the values that we've already got, and that's where we stay. 
So if you're someone who's interested in reform at a deeper level, this might not be the theory that really does very much for you. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in that respect, bringing this up as a theory of justice is to bring up a theory which really is not a theory you can use to interrogate, question, or challenge <coughs> the institutions of your society. It's really a theory that tells you why you should embrace the institutions. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, Prof, you've spoken about the divisions intra-America. Of course, America isn't necessarily the best model to use for the rest of the world as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it may not even be the best model for America. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. that's true. Um, so, and you spoke about how roles things that this is the best sort of overlapping consensus you can ever get. Um, what is what is your take on, on, on this? I mean, is, can we go further and and come up with some 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 form of theory which is more universal than this? Well, there are two things here, really. I mean, you can ask whether it's possible to get uh, a more universal theory, and that's only a question that many people have explored. But you can also ask the question: Well, should we be trying to find a universal theory? Uh, and let me start with the second concern first, because one of the problems with searching for a universal theory is that person doing the searching is very likely to find universality in his own particularity. You know, there's the, uh, the joke that if a, you know, if, if a triangle had a god, it would have three sides. It's not surprising when Europeans were looking for universal theories, they found it in understandings that were, in a sense, implicit in Christian traditions. So when you know, European settlers went to the New World and preached to the uh, Native Americans. What they told them was that you know, here are the rights that you have and here are the rights you don't have, uh, and these are universal truths. And we know these are universal truths because you know, the best minds in our tradition have investigated these things, and we've established to our own satisfaction that these are universal truths. Well. Uh, why should one believe anyone who goes around saying there are certain universal truths? Particularly when one thinks about the fact that the world is so diverse that there are all kinds of uh, different ways of thinking, different ways of being, and so on. Now, that isn't to say that that means that uh, there are no common moral standards, that there aren't things that people everywhere seem to agree on. But the fact that there are some things that everyone seems to agree on does not suffice to actually develop something as complicated as a conception of justice that might be universally accepted. Um, even if you took something as seemingly straightforward as norms about killing, you might say, look, you know, everybody thinks that murder is wrong. Well, you shouldn't really say murders. Murder, by definition, is unlawful killing, but you, everyone says that killing is wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, of course they don't. I mean, some people think that abortion is murder, others think that it's justifiable killing, yet others think that the fetus is not even a person, so there's no question of killing. Uh, there are different views about capital punishment. There are you know, many different views about when you can legitimately kill in warfare. So it's very difficult to find um, universal uh, values or universal truths which are in fact universally accepted. Uh, let me give you one uh, other example. Iran is a signatory to most of the UN treaties, including um, treaties which specify what counts as cruel and uh, unusual punishment. But when it had the practice of uh, cutting off uh, the hands of people who were caught stealing, they were brought to, to task, and they were told they were failing to comply with the um, 
with the treaty, but they responded, no, we, we're not. We take this treaty very seriously, but we think this is not uh, a misinterpretation. This is. Now, um, you might all accept the norm in principle, but how are you going to interpret it? If it's possible to interpret something with that degree of latitude, then it makes it difficult to say, well, yes, there are universal values. Everybody values friendship, you might say. That they may all think very differently about what friendship is. What friendship is in ancient Greece or in modern America might be different to the way, say, an Aboriginal community conceives of friendship. So looking for the universal um, is not as uh, easy a thing to do for all kinds of reasons, and not the ones I've just mentioned. Um, and moving on to the sort of subject of fundamental liberties. Obviously, if um, the quest for a universal theory of justice is inevitably a, I could say, fruitless one, then the quest for universal um, liberties and rights, which would be justified by the theory of justice, will also be a, a futile one. And so, of course, Rawls, in his first principle, talks about um, equal scheme of basic liberties to everyone. Um, so, Prof, it would be your contention then that that sort of prescription is really one which is uh, confined by the American experience and one that is not truly universal in that sense. This particular um, approach or methodology is, uh, I think, one that has some of these flaws that I mentioned. And I think consequently, and I think this is the point that you're making, trying to defend something like liberty by appeal to this larger conception is going to be problematic because that means that if you don't buy into this larger theory, you've got no reason to accept the case for, for freedom. But of course, there are other ways of defending, let's just stick with the idea of freedom with defending this particular idea. One can certainly do it in the context of the particular circumstances uh, that one finds oneself in, you know, in the context of a particular debate. I mean, if, for example, um, a government wants to limit some particular liberty, it seems to me that it's open to say to the, to the government, well, what warrant have you got for making this restriction. Here are a whole uh, number of reasons why perhaps you shouldn't be limiting. Firstly, limiting someone's freedom is causing a positive harm to that particular person. Uh, why would you want to do this? Is there some greater good that's, uh, that's being promoted by this? Is it appropriate, even for the greater good, to make some set of people sacrifice themselves. Now, if the response to any set of liberty is not a value at all, um, well, that can still be questioned, challenged um, within the terms of you know, um, that particular claim itself, but also in terms of other things that the community of uh, interlocutors on this issue might well accept. I mean, let's say you took the case in Malaysia, supposing that uh, a government says, that we're going to restrict these particular liberties, and this is what uh, relations want. Well, I don't think you need to appeal to Rawls's theory. You can start it by saying, well, is this really what all relations want? Clearly, some relations don't want this. What's the justification that you're going to give? Um, what is the, the warrant for harm in these relations? And if it does benefit some other relations, why is that a sufficient reason? just because some people are gaining doesn't mean that others need to be, to be limited. If the argument is put that, well, you know, these are ultimately Malaysian values, you can say, well, they seem to be values that a lot of Malaysians don't accept. So what is the warrant for claiming that these are Malaysian values? And what makes you think that your interpretation of this is the authority? There are all kinds of ways of you know, engaging I think ultimately, in any society, if you're going to 
make arguments about values. You've got to do the arguing in terms that people can um, accept and acknowledge. Um, because if you simply appeal to a, to a more abstract theory, unless the premises are ones that people do in fact accept, you're not going to get very far with your arguments. Um, in that case, uh, let's take the example of a so-called liberal society, for example, and try to figure out what sort of values would be shared in liberal society. Um, uh, obviously, Rawls has quite complicated view, you know, ex explanations about um, the right to free speech, the right to free association. Those are the things that he thinks in a liberal society. Those are the things that uh, the values of the society would hold paramount. Mm -hmm. what, what is your view on, on, on these rights? in a liberal society. Whether a liberal society is a liberal society actually requires these values to be held paramount. Okay. I'm going to give you an answer which begins in the first instance by raising a doubt about the whole idea of a society. It's not that I want to deny the existence of societies uh, in principle, but when you start the discussion by talking about a liberal society, it sounds very much as if you're talking about something that's bounded, mm -hmm. that this is somehow sealed or closed. But of course, um, you know, human society, in a sense, is continuous. Political boundaries may well exist. Jurisdictions uh, are to be found everywhere. But these jurisdictional boundaries don't close a society because a society exists when people interact and associate, which they constantly do across all kinds of boundaries. They do it very easily across the boundaries of things like counties. They do it across the boundaries of provinces. You know, between Salango and Pera, there's still interaction and trade. But they also do it across national boundaries. You, know, you can see very clearly in Europe, for example, in the Schengen area, people just move freely from one place to another. People live in a country and work in another. They uh, trade with one another quite freely. Goods move back and forth. Labor moves back and forth. Um, so if you're going to talk about a liberal society, um, it's not necessarily the case that the entity in question is something like a state. And I'm, I'm raising this because I think that many people talk about a liberal society, they're really talking about a liberal state. Um, now, when Rawls talks about this, he wants to think about it in terms of the liberal state because he conceives of the subject matter of his theory, which is to say um, the appropriate institutions for a particular liberal society. He conceives of this as a closed society. And those are his words, not mine. And what I want to say really is that if we're going to think about a liberal society, we need to move away from this. Because a liberal, um, let's call it uh, social order or a liberal uh, realm, is one in which there isn't this closeness. Okay? There isn't this attempt to confine people within particular boundaries. And certainly not an attempt to say that first and foremost, they are members of some particular uh, entity which precludes their cooperating with others except on terms that the people in this particular subset of humanity deem appropriate. Now, once you start thinking about a liberal society in those terms, I think justice becomes a much more difficult concept to put in the center of the theory because justice as we've seen from the critique of, uh, of Rawls, really does presuppose having some kind of you know, closely um, agreed, shared values. But you know, once you broaden the scope to a much greater realm, well, people do have very different views about justice, different views about the proper basis for 
distribution, but who is preserving and who is not, what kinds of liberties are important. Now, if that's the case, if you're going to still have a society in which people can interact and operate, it seems to me you need to describe this with some different kind of concept. Now, I myself prefer a concept like toleration, but I don't think in the end the term is the critical thing. But what I would prefer to think of it um, as is a society, a society in the broadest sense in which um, different norms of justice can coexist, but still enable people to associate, cooperate, interact in, in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. So from my point of view, you know, this is the way to try to think about um, uh, society and you know, moral and political values. So bro, I'm, I might be at risk of oversimplifying your ideas here, but it seems to me that you're saying that really the most important freedom is really the freedom to choose what freedoms you want. Um, that's that's a, a way of putting it, I think. Um, I would only be a little bit careful about it because it presupposes that every society will in fact value freedom in the same way and to the same degree. And there may be you know, societies and groups of people for whom freedom is much less important um, and thinking of freedom to choose. Um, because there are differences in understandings about what freedoms uh, you do generally have um, as freedoms to choose. Now, uh, you know, I myself would like to see societies having much greater uh, inclination to admit um, the kinds of freedoms that we find in, uh, in societies like Britain and the United States and Australia and so on. Um, but I recognize there are many places and many traditions which aren't um, going to think about freedom in exactly the same way. Um, but, but that said, I, I think this is it's not a bad way of, uh, of thinking about it because I think it, it picks out something that's, that's really quite important, and that is that given this diversity uh, of values, given this variety of uh, outlooks, it's very difficult then for any one individual group or sector or a community or a society or a state come out and say, look, you know, we are actually decisive and authoritative interpreters of what the people think in this particular area. It's very difficult for um, a member of, uh, of a state or a government of the state to say, look, we are, the, we are the, 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 the decisive interpreters. It may be easier in some states, I mean, maybe in Tibet, for example, where it's independent, there'd be sufficient um, commonality of outlook that you could do certain things. And certainly in some countries where there are more homogeneous populations, that might be easier. But in any society that has a moderate amount of diversity, it becomes very difficult for a government to turn around and say, you know, we are the decisive interpreters. Mm -hmm. And you would say then that the, the crucial thing for people in such societies is is for them to associate with the values that they, they themselves hold dear, that they have the freedom of choice to actually choose what sort of values they hold dear? Well, they won't so much choose their values. Um, most of the values.